Europe was almost constantly at war in the 16th and 17th centuries in what became known as the Wars of Religion. And in the far-off New World, European powers were intent on doing as much damage to, capturing as much treasure from, Spanish ships and settlements as possible. Instead of carrying on a traditional war, England and France provided private ships with letters of mark, also called letters of course, essentially to carry on an undeclared war across the Atlantic. And among the first of these quasi-official pirates were French privateers that were called by the swashbuckling name Corsairs, and they were intimately tied to the wars of religion. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Shortly after Columbus returned to Europe with word of untold wealth and native kingdoms, Spain sought to formalize their ownership of the far-off lands by papal decree in the form of the papal bull called Intercatira. Spain took the bull as giving them full sovereignty over lands west and south of the islands of Cape Verde and the Azores. They later formalized their agreement with Portugal in the 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas. Neither France nor England recognized Spain or Portugal's claims of sovereignty over yet unexplored lands. Other nations' ships trading in the New World were not tolerated. In 1505, Portuguese ships destroyed three French ships in a surprise attack. And Portugal so fiercely defended Brazil's shores that French merchantmen armed their ships to fight back. One of the primary French leaders was shipowner Jean Ango of Dieppe, who even blockaded Lisbon. In fact, Portugal amplified colonization activities in part to defend their claims against the French. Infuriated, King Francis of France denied the right of the Pope to distribute lands and reportedly asked to see Adam's will to learn how he had partitioned the world. The true genesis of French corsairs, however, came in 1522 or 1523 when one of Ango's privateers, Jean Fleury, also called Florin, came upon three Spanish ships near the coast of Portugal. According to one of the Spanish captains, the three caravels were loaded up with treasure directly from Montezuma and the Aztecs. So loaded with treasure, in fact, that the Spanish caravels were slow, and flurry ships quickly bore down on them. We fought them from two caravels, the captain wrote, until we were overpowered, when everything eminently valuable on the way to your majesty, the king of Spain, was lost. The second captain was killed, while the third ship managed to escape to bring word to Spain. Flurry captured an incredible prize, which included several tons of sugar, three huge cases of gold ingots, 500 pounds weight of gold dust in bags, Aztec pearls weighing 680 pounds, and emeralds, topazes, golden masks set with gems, Aztec rings and helmets, and feathered cloaks. One contemporary chronicler estimated the value at 150,000 ducats. Especially admired was a huge emerald, beyond all price, so transparent, brilliant, and admirably pure. Fleury's prize stunned Europe, and now all of Europe knew just how rich the New World was. Relatively little is known about Jean Fleury, except that after capturing several dozen ships, he was captured by the Spanish, taken back to Spain. In 1527, he was hanged as a pirate. King Francis saw the value of capturing Spanish treasure and impressing his claims of sovereignty in the New World, but didn't relish war. Instead, he engaged his admirals and men, like Jean Ango, to distribute letters of course, from which the name Corsair derives, to French captains. French Corsairs were among the first and largest group to sail to the Spanish Main in the early to mid-16th century. At the same time, a revolution was happening across Europe that would have an enormous impact on those who sailed as a Corsair. In 1517, Martin Luther published his 95 Theses, and four years later he was excommunicated by Pope Leo X. The Protestant Reformation spread quickly, including in France, home to notable reformer John Calvin. French Protestants, following a largely Calvinist doctrine, became known as Huguenots, even though the name itself is of uncertain etymology. Conflict between Catholics and Protestants in the country quickly became a defining issue of 16th century France, sparking the French wars of religion and a series of edicts that would eventually ban the Huguenot religion altogether. Some parts of the country had significant Huguenot populations, especially ports, including Dieppe, La Rochelle, and, to a lesser extent, St. Malo. These cities were known for having large fleets, and people like Jean Ango sponsored voyages whose only purpose was piracy. In the 1580s, a French historian wrote that nearly all seafaring men in France were Protestant, especially those who came from Normandy. Spain was deeply connected to Catholicism. Ferdinand and Isabella were known as the Catholic monarchs. The deepening divide between Protestants and Catholics caused violence across Europe nearly from the start. 
Additionally, the 1519 election of Charles V, King of Spain, as Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, left France surrounded by enemies, which encouraged King Francis to enlist a fleet of privateers to strike at Spanish treasure fleets. 1528 saw the first recorded French corsair in the Caribbean, when a single French ship attacked the village of San German on the island of Puerto Rico. While corsairs were usually not actually pirates, as they acted under the letters of course, the Spanish certainly viewed them as little better than pirates, and were especially offended by the heresy of Protestantism. To the Spanish, all French corsairs were Lutherans. Huguenot privateers captured by the Spanish could expect not treatment as prisoners of war, but torture at the hands of the Inquisition and to be hanged as religious heretics. In return, the Huguenot pirates destroyed churches and at one point even hung a statue of St. Peter from a hut and pelted it with oranges. In 1571, several corsairs mocked the sacrament of transubstantiation by cooking a statue of baby Jesus. As agents of France, the corsairs were generally expected to give up some portion of the captured booty to the throne and to respect ships of neutral nations, neither of which rule was strictly adhered to. Corsairs primarily worked on a ransom system, sacking towns, capturing citizens, demanding ransom for their return. They caused significant mayhem and death in the Spanish settlements throughout the 16th century. In 1537, corsairs demanded a 700 ducat ransom from Havana. Chased off by Spanish men of war, they merely returned later, demanding another ransom. Jamaica and Havana and Cuba both faced raids again in 1538 by enterprising corsairs. French corsairs filled the narrow strait between Cuba and Key West, Florida, and captured nine Spanish ships in the strait in 1537 and 1538. While France and Spain were at peace nearly as often as they were at war, the idea of no peace beyond the line meant that peace in Europe rarely meant a cease to hostilities in the Caribbean. In 1543, a particularly violent attack on Havana left 200 Spanish dead, and in 1544 there was a Huguenot attack on Cartagena, then almost defenseless. Stories about the attack abound, but a contemporary traveler claims that a Spanish renegade, angry at having been whipped by a judge, led the French in. A version related by CartaginaIndias.com claims that the pirates ambushed the city while a prominent citizen was getting married. And the corsairs made off with booty in the range of 150,000 ducats of gold. Beyond the line, the corsairs were highly active, assaulting Spanish settlements at least 60 times between 1536 and 1547 and capturing dozens of ships. The Spanish responded by fortifying their settlements, with Havana's first fortress built under Hernando de Soto in 1540. They also began organizing flotas, or convoys, that would have merchant ships sail with military escort beginning in the 1520s, but Spain's early efforts were far from perfect. Between 1536 and 1563, 66 ships were captured in the Caribbean by privateers and pirates. And worse was yet to come, as one historian described it, the greatest pirate attack of the 16th century. Jacques de Sor was a Huguenot corsair active in the 1550s, whose escapades earned him the title, The Exterminating Angel. He was associated with Francois Leclerc, another corsair who was known for his peg leg. And the pair were sent with another corsair and several ships on the orders of French King Henry II to raid the Caribbean. Between 1553 and 1555, the corsairs brought terror to the Spanish main. The cleric, possibly accompanied by Sor, attacked San German and in 1554 occupied and destroyed Santiago de Cuba. Sor was alone in 1555 when he launched an attack on Havana. Reports of the attack disagree wildly on what the assault looked like. He had between two and twenty ships, but he easily captured the fortress with a landing party. Sor was disappointed with his capture of the town, which did not contain any large prize of treasure demanded a ransom of 30,000 pesos to spare the town, but instead the governor of the island led an attack intended to drive Sor out. When that failed, Sor killed most of his prisoners, leveled the town, and sailed off at the fort's cannons. Sor's religious motivations were clear by his murder of 40 Jesuit missionaries in 1570. The failure of the fort to protect the city led the Spanish to throw even more money into defending their settlements, which remained largely at the mercy of the corsairs. Spain had even larger fortifications built at Havana and Cartagena in the decades that followed, such as the Castle of the Royal Force, completed at Havana in 1570. Spain developed the Spanish Galleon, specifically meant to protect Spanish treasure fleets, and in the 1560s, the Spanish king ordered all treasure fleets to gather at Havana before sailing to the Atlantic. The transition to heavily organized fleets, which left Spain twice a year to return with colonial treasure, was a significant development and did an excellent job in deterring pirates and privateers. In France, the Huguenots were engaged in a series of civil wars against French Catholics and the monarchy between 1562 and 1598. 
Gaspard de Coligny, uh, Admiral of France, became the de facto leader of the Huguenots in 1569, but had sought a refuge for French Protestants long before that. He had supported the 1555 colony of French Antarctique in Brazil, which had been destroyed by the Portuguese in 1567. Next, he supported expeditions to Spanish Florida, first at Charles Fort on Paris Island, South Carolina, which soon failed, and then at Fort Caroline in 1564 to found piratical colonies to raid the Spanish. The two primary leaders of the expedition were René du Lundinier and Jean Ribot. Lundinier established Fort Caroline on June 22, 1564. The colony struggled and had to rely heavily on Native Americans for supply. The French even assisted their primary ally in several assaults on other nearby tribes, although relations soon soured. The colony hastily built some small ships, hoping to try their luck at piracy, but the ships were quickly taken over by mutineers. By 1565, the settlers were ready to go home and survived by trading four of their cannons to English adventurer John Hawkins for a ship and provisions. I may say that we received in many courtesies of the general, as it were possible, to receive of any man living, deserving to be esteemed as much of us as if he had saved all our lives, wrote Lundinier. Ribot arrived at the colony in late August of 1565, dashing the locals with hundreds of soldiers and new settlers. But unfortunately, the Spanish had tasked Don Pedro Menendez de Avilla, governor of Florida, to remove the French. After skirmish, Menendez retreated southwards and founded St. Augustine. Each had around 500 soldiers. Ribot gave chase, hoping to destroy the Spanish in a preemptive strike. They surprised the Spanish at St. Augustine, but most of the Spanish were able to escape. They went in search of one of the Spanish vessels, and two days later were struck by a violent storm. Three of Ribot's four ships were lost in the storm, and his flagship, La Ternite, was stranded on a sandbar. Menendez, meanwhile, marched overland to the lightly defended Fort Caroline, killing 130 men there. While some escaped, and most of the women and children were captured. Menendez then went and captured the French who had been shipwrecked, but most of those who surrendered he had killed. The site of that massacre is now called Matanzas, Spanish for killing inlet. The Spanish ambassador defended the slaughter by claiming that the French were no soldiers but thieving pirates and were punished according to their deserts, and that they were heretics as well. Huguenot pirates remained in the Spanish main and in 1573 joined Francis Drake in the successful capture of a land-based treasure train carrying some 30 tons of silver and gold. The wars of religion back in France were deadly for all sides, but for the Protestants especially. In 1572, Catholics attacked Protestants in the bloody St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which ended in the deaths of 5,000 to 30,000 Huguenots, including Admiral Cognier. The wars of religion saw Huguenot pirates turn against the crown, who gathered primarily at the port of La Rochelle. And like Cogne, the French admirals split during the war to follow their own objectives, and the king lost all control of the corsairs. The loss of Fort Caroline and snubbing of Huguenot leaders led directly into the second and third wars of religion in France, and corsairs received letters, of course, to assault other Frenchmen in a holy war against Catholics. Piracy against Catholics effectively funded the Protestant war effort. The French king was forced to completely remake the French admiralty system to put it under his own control. With the deaths of all the Protestant leadership in the 1570s, Huguenot pirates began to fade, although some remained at La Rochelle until it was captured by Cardinal Richelieu in 1628. The 1598 Edict of Nantes put an end to the wars of religion and actually guaranteed some rights for the Huguenots, although that didn't last. The 1685 Edict of Fontainebleau drove an exodus of Protestants from France, and in the ensuing years, Protestantism was mostly wiped out in the country. But privateering still continued in the Caribbean. It's just that fewer men were motivated by religion in the 17th century. And the 1713 Peace of Utrecht put an end to the Corsairs altogether. Whether you refer to them as pirates or as privateers, the Corsairs were the product of the fraught religious division of the time, as well as the deadly competition among empires that occurred in the early modern era, creating what some historians have referred to as a silver age of piracy, a century ahead of the better known golden age of piracy in the Caribbean. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.